Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I am Bill Levine from New York City. Uh, I am the chair of orthopedics at New York Presbyterian and Columbia University Medical Center. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, we are really excited to have you all here. Um, I'm going to introduce folks in a second, but just give you a, a little bit of an overview uh, of why we decided to do this. Um, we thought that the the match has just occurred for fourth year medical students, one of whom you'll meet shortly. Um, and we wanted to, traditionally, we would all be meeting with the rising fourth year medical students in our individual mentoring roles, uh, but because of COVID-19, uh, that's actually not possible. So we came up with this idea to do this webinar tonight to basically serve as a, a mentorship opportunity for right now 514 of you uh, who are on this webinar. So it's uh, pretty amazing uh, that, that you're all here. I'll just give you a very brief overview. I, I know many of you uh, have heard the statistics, but let me give you a very personal perspective on how COVID-19 has impacted us in New York City. Yeah. On, on March 16th, can everybody, uh, uh, can you please uh, mute your, your, uh, your mics if you're not speaking? Thanks so much. On, on March 13th, um, we had a, a meeting with our CEO about potentially uh, reducing elective surgery in New York, in, at New York Presbyterian by 10% the following week. That was a 7 a.m. meeting on Friday morning. And we decided because some people were canceling surgeries already because they were fearful of COVID-19, that the 10% was actually going to be self-regulated. We really didn't have to reduce our uh, elective surgical cases. By three o'clock that afternoon, we were called, all the surgical chairs were called by the CEO to tell us that all elective surgery would be canceled the following week. And we spent the weekend then going over uh, how to get in touch with patients and cancel their surgeries. By Wednesday, we had 25 inpatients in the New York Presbyterian system who were COVID positive. As of this morning, we have 2,350 COVID positive patients in the New York Presbyterian system. 660 in the intensive care units and 100% intubated. So the doubling that you hear about and the Wuhan experience and the Italian experience uh, is absolutely what the New York City experience has been. And it has completely upended everything that we held true and dear to us in all of society uh, and medicine of course included. Uh, so that's just a background for how we got here and what's happening in our world. Um, we're going to, um, uh, I'd like to start out by uh, asking Dr. Seth Dodds to introduce himself and then we'll uh, introduce the rest of the panel. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Seth Dodds. Uh, I am an Associate Program Director at the University of Miami. I used to work also at Yale and was the Associate Program Director there. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion to try to help all of you students out there better understand how to tackle uh, this summer, which I think is gonna be a challenge, but also beyond this summer uh, to give you the best shot at matching orthopedics. And I'm gonna pass the baton to Dr. Cipriano. Hi, uh, my name is Cara Cipriano. I'm an orthopedic oncologist at Washington University in St. Louis. I've been in practice there for about six years and I'm also the director of medical student education for the Department of Orthopedics, including a lot of engagement and mentoring activities as well. Kyle. Hi, my name is Kyle McCormick. Um, I'm one of the graduating fourth year students from Columbia um, and I just recently matched at Columbia for residency. Hi everyone, I'm Caroline Granger. I'm an incoming fourth year at the University of Miami and I'm a med student, so I'm in the similar boat as most of the participants of this webinar. Um, I'm applying to ortho this coming cycle, so I will be kind of talking to the perspective of an applicant. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, about, I don't know, maybe a year ago, I got a random email from some guy named Tab Zayer, uh, who is a foot and ankle surgeon at the University of Miami and he's gonna introduce the rest of his uh, colleagues. They had started this thing called Ortho Mentor. It was on some platform called Instagram of which I was not a member. They needed somebody with gray hair to, uh, to be part of their, their little cabal. And, uh, and so they told me a little bit about what they were doing and I thought it was the coolest thing ever because it was right up my alley 
uh, for many of you who know me, um, mentorship and education is kind of the highest on my list of the things that I am passionate about. And so uh, I said, sure. And Tabs asked me to participate and uh, do some posts. And uh, that led to tonight's collaborative effort between Columbia, University of Miami, Ortho Mentor, Wash U. Uh, and uh, it's really exciting. So I'd like to uh, introduce Tabs Ayer, who is an incredibly passionate educator and mentor from the University of Miami, and he'll introduce uh, the rest of the Ortho Mentor crew. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, everyone, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I think there are just, we're working on letting folks come in. I think it was a little bit of a troubleshooting issue with regards to having everyone get in. Uh, we're currently at 500 some applicants, but for those who are trying to make their way in, please let your friends know that we are working on uh, increasing the capacity. So it was probably back in my, between college med school residency where I really got into the kind of I became developed a passion for mentoring and it was through this and through my connections actually with Matt when he was a medical student uh, back at Penn State Hershey and then with uh, sort of my co-fellow co-fellow adventures with uh, Jonathan Kaplan that the three of us came together really to design sort of a platform that was going to make it much more easy for for students to engage to get advising uh, from with really a quality with a high level of quality perspective and that's in part what allowed us to form OrthoMentor. So myself specifically I'm an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon down at the University of Miami. I'm the faculty faculty advisor for the orthopedic student interest group down here um, and I work uh, quite closely with uh, Dr. Seth Dodds as well. Uh, we have an, you know, an elective um, at the medical school as well. So we do a lot of engagement with the medical students on campus and via OrthoMentor do a lot of advising uh, both nationally and internationally with uh, Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Barakalo. I'll pass it on to Dr. Barakalo to introduce himself a little further. <clears throat> so Tab's great introduction as always. Um, Matt Barakalo, I am actually, so I'm eight, nine months into practice. I am uh, the chief of the sports medicine division in a seven hospital healthcare system called Penn Highlands. We're about 90 miles outside of Pittsburgh. So it's a, it's a growing and budding program. We're actually affiliated with uh, Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. So I do actually work with family medicine residents. I also have students um, that um, are interested in orthopedics that rotate on my service. And, and uh, before this all went down, they were currently rotating uh, with me. So I'm, I'm out of fellowship from University of Kentucky and uh, in my first year of practice. I'll turn it over to Dr. Kaplan now. Last but not least. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Jonathan Kaplan. I am a foot and ankle specialist as well in orthopedics. Tabs and I were co-fellows together. Uh, I practice out in Orange County, California at Hogue Orthopedic Institute, and I am the fellowship director of our foot and ankle fellowship here. And um, the three of us kind of came together to create OrthoMentor for platforms like this. And so uh, I think as a team, hopefully we can give you a good comprehensive review and I'm excited to be a part of this panel. Uh, Tabs, before we get going, I'm, I, I think that there's some technical difficulties. Just everybody tell your friends if they can't get on, this is being videoed. We will get it out to everybody. We apologize. We had such an incredible turnout. Uh, there were almost 900 people that had registered and we just thought 400 didn't uh, come on, but it turns out that 400 can't get on at the moment. So we do apologize, but it is being videoed. So um, take it away, Tabs. I think, uh, I'll thank everybody for your kind introductions. Uh, it's wonderful to be with everyone tonight. And again, our apologies about, uh, for the folks who are having some difficulty getting on, we'll try to get it rectified. And again, it is being recorded. I think one of the most sort of the biggest elephants in the room, if you will, is the fact that the coronavirus situation is uh, having probably a major effect, not just on our frontline responders, but obviously the after effects are trickling down to uh, the medical schools as well. And I think what's uh, particularly important is for us to be able to, you know, better understand and at least, you know, talk uh, very openly, um, although a little bit speculative, as to how the, the pandemic is going to impact the next sort of cycle of applicants, uh, and specifically with regards to a few different topics. So some of the things that we want to consider, um, it want to consider is how it might affect away rotations, even the start of residency, and obviously even the residency selection process. Uh, so these are some of the things we're going to be talking about right now, and I'll pass the, and I'll uh, kind of have Dr. Levine kick this off uh, with his experience as chairman um, at this point in time. <clears throat> So, you know, I think that the, the challenge that we will cover tonight, and, and we're going to cover it from obviously lots of great different perspectives, program director, medical, uh, medical education director from uh, CARA's perspective, 
um, a just recently matched student and then a rising fourth year. Uh, but normally this is the time where you all are uh, figuring out where you're gonna do your sub eyes. And you're figuring that out based on a often very opaque understanding of where you might sit in your class. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is plea with all of your deans, program directors, associate program directors, medical school directors, to actually sit down with you and say, to the best of your ability, you have to let me know where I stand in my class of five, eight, 10, 12 students applying from my school, because there's a very real chance that I may not be able to do sub eyes this year. And if I can't do any sub eyes, then I won't have an ability or uh, opportunity to differentiate myself compared to the other students uh, from my peer, from my school. Uh, so that's my first plea to you. Uh, there are many of us that do that in the country, but a lot of programs don't. And when I uh, interview uh, students for interviews and talk to them when they come and do their away rotations, I ask every student, uh, do you know where you rank in your class? And 90% of the time, the answer is no. They have no idea where they may, where they rank. And I think there's never been a time where that's gonna be more important for us to be able to help mentor you uh, if indeed you end up not being able to do sub eyes this year. And that still is unknown, of course, but if you don't, then we're gonna really need to be able to help guide you on which programs to apply to, how many to apply to, uh, and not each cross over and kill each other because you really don't wanna go to that school, but you're gonna apply because you're not sure where you're ranked in your class and you're gonna apply to 89, 95, 100, 150 programs because of the fear of not matching. Those, those are great points. Uh, Dr. Dodds, uh, how do you think that the, the pandemic is gonna affect our ability to, you know, kind of for, for students to do away rotations and just the overall selection process uh, for those who are going to apply this upcoming cycle? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest challenge um, that uh, is definitely an unknown about not being able to do sub eyes. But what that really presents in my mind is a challenge for the students to demonstrate that they are, that they work well with a team, that they have drive, initiative, um, that they are hard workers. All of these things that we see in the clinical setting will be really impossible to demonstrate. And I think finding ways, and you may have to be creative as a medical student, uh, to show those initiatives, uh, your passion, your drive, and your uh, teamwork uh, sense, I think it's going to be really important uh, to be able to demonstrate that really locally to your own uh, letter writers and your own faculty members. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think there's an easy way to do that. I don't have an answer for that. But I think that may be the holy grail um, if we don't have uh, clinical rotations to make that assessment. Um, Dr. Cipriano, what are your thoughts? You know how, and you, we were talking beforehand about some of the questions your students are bringing up. Uh, you know, with regards to advising, what kinds of things are you suggesting to them, uh, based on what you've heard um, and based on what your feeling is, uh, in light of everything going on? Thanks, Ted. Um, number one, as with everything about this pandemic, we have a lot of uncertainty. Um, I just, uh, in our meeting with the uh, medical school leadership today, there were a few points that I, I thought were worth um, passing along. Number one, the feeling was that there will be a delay in, uh, um, in away rotations. Uh, and that's, that's probably, that's looking like a reality. Um, but the other points were, number two, that students won't be disadvantaged by this. Um, it's not as if uh, some will have the opportunity to rotate at, um, whereas essentially everyone in the program in the country is in the same boat with this. Um, so that's important to remember. And uh, so there will be opportunities kind of equally um, taken away or given. Um, and, and that the AAMC is working on this and trying to develop uh, uh, some sort of policy or statement. So, there will be um, leadership on this topic and, uh, and we just have to wait a little bit longer for that. 
I would say uh, what I, the message that I would give to students who are in the, be, about to begin applying, um, focus on what you can do in the absence of having information about what exactly is going to happen. So even though there's a lot of uncertainty, what can you do to, um, to make your application strong? And, and I think two things. One, the point about um, making your impression with your home program is really important. I think the strongest letters tend to come out of home programs uh, rather than away rotations, which tend, you know, you have less time. So um, duration and depth of exposure is going to be greater at your home program now as even more than ever. Um, and also just thinking about what, uh, how, you, how you're going to come out as an applicant through, um, through the application elements that we still have. So, uh, as, you know, thinking about what makes, what makes you, what do you bring to the table that's unique and how's that going to show up in your application? Um, I think that that is going to be very important as well. Hey, um, Cara, can I just, uh, there's a couple of questions coming in and it's a nice segue. Uh, what happens if I don't have a home program? Um, and, uh, Boy, uh, you know, you're, you're already challenging us, um, uh, people in the registration out there, that's, these are hard questions. Uh, but the, because they're so hard, I'm gonna put it right to my friend Tabs and say, Tabs, we've got two students who already have said, I don't have a home program, what the heck do I do? Not an easy question. And to be honest, I, if I were, I've had many students already ask me this, and I think the, one of the things you can do is to try to reach out to folks in the local area, other programs even regionally, wherever you're at, and try to identify shadowing opportunities. And I think those shadowing opportunities often facilitate the organic, as I always say, organic development of mentorships and even potentially research opportunities. And it's an, a very easy uh, a very easy and sublime way of getting to know people at other institutions where there is an, an orthopedics program uh, or residency program. And while that may not be ideal right now, especially in light of the fact that everyone's pretty much quarantined, like all of us here today, I definitely think that at least reaching out and try, trying to engage with faculty at many places, many of whom are going to be responsive, is an easy way to at least start the conversation. And even now try to highlight, hey, if there's interest in research as a way of engaging with them and developing some additional sort of uh, additional things on your CV that will demonstrate your interest uh, and, you know, academic acumen. And that is, that's what I would impart suggest and what I've been suggesting to students now. I think another thing to consider is, hey, you know, you've got this time to study for step two conceivably. Well, then work on studying for step two. You know, even if you don't know when you're going to take it exactly, that's another thing you can work to kind of add to at least the academic side of your application. That, that's in part what I've been telling students who've been reaching out to me with, you know, with this sort of predicament at this point. I, I think it's important for all the students that are out here, and, and, and there's a lot of program directors on this webinar, and I'm getting great texts from friends all over the country. So thanks, thanks folks. Um, remember, you're all in the same boat. Uh, and I, I think Cara was just really highlighting that, but I wanna make sure that we cement that home. There's, there's not gonna be a haves and haves nots. There's not gonna be some schools that are gonna let you go do sub eyes and others that are not. It's, it's an all or none phenomenon. So if there are no sub eyes, there'll be no sub eyes for any, everybody. If there are only sub eyes starting in September, October or October, November, that's what it'll be. Uh, the dean's letter is going to be pushed back for sure. I think that's also important to understand. It's not going to be the typical timeline for the dean's letter. So they're going to do everything they can to try to make the playing field as fair as possible. I would say to those students that are listening that don't have a home program, get a mentor now. Um, it can be one of the people from Ortho Mentor. It can be one of the people on this webinar. I get cold emails all the time from people to, and I'm happy to review your application and I'm happy to tell you uh, where you stand relative to the typical students that I review. Uh, and I know that the Ortho Mentor guys are happy to do that. I'm sure everyone else would be as well. So there's plenty of incredibly uh, committed educators and mentors around the country and, and you've got to take some risk. You're at a place that doesn't have a home program. Well, now more than ever, take a chance, send your uh, CV to folks, 
uh, and then we'll be happy to try to help you with that. Um, go so, ahead, Sam. oh, what I was going to ask, uh, I was going to ask Dr. Dodds, you know, from your from your perspective, how do you think the what metrics in your mind are going to be more important going forward without away rotations? If if away rotations are truly canceled at the end of the day, and we're sort of speculating that right now what sort of metrics become more important from a residency application review perspective specifically? Yeah, I mean, I'm someone who uh, feels strongly that actually the away rotations in your, your clinical performance is probably the most important thing. Um, so that's a little bit of a hard question for me to answer if I feel like the one thing that's the most critical is the one that's being taken away from me. I actually am not someone who loves to analyze the test scores. Um, uh, so I would say your letters of recommendation and probably another thing that's really going to be very important is actually having your mentor speak up for you, uh, which may mean that faculty members are going to be talking to each other more often in between programs to say, you know what, I've got this great student who's awesome. They really want to be at Duke and um, I'll call someone there and, and um, you know, try to create a relationship. Uh, otherwise, I, you know, uh, we're, we're going to be stuck looking at things that it's possible the personal statement is going to be much more important. Um, very difficult to tell. Uh, but everything that you can do to make your paper application as, as perfect as possible is going to be helpful, uh, for sure. Actually, I want to ask Caroline. So Caroline, you know, you're, you're in the hot seat right now in terms of feeling all this kind of information, you're hearing this from, you know, different parts of the country. What, what questions are weighing on your mind as a future applicant? And I think that uh, at a future applicant, and I think that that's something that, you know, what questions are going on or going through your head at this point in time? Uh, yeah, I think the first question would be if having no away rotations is the fate that we're seeing how we can still articulate our interest in certain programs to those programs, because typically doing the away rotations is how we do that. And then um, also going off of that, if you were someone who already did apply to a couple away rotations, um, how, how to like approach that if um, you've been in communication maybe with them or haven't, and maybe later down the road, all of them say, you can come during this one month. Like how, how should someone approach that when uh, you're faced with that big decision? So I guess both of those things. Cara, what do you think? Sorry, I was typing. <laughs> uh, so Caroline is, I think, in part asking, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Caroline, but you know, if, hey, you're faced with this question, hey, you could potentially do, you know, rotation at a place later on for whatever the reason may be, it is, is that something you should just drop everything and try to do it um, at that point in time? Um, and, you know, how, how do you kind of handle that situation that becomes available to you? So is this the scenario where um, you, it's a program of your, ch like a first choice program for you and it opens up later on and you've already gotten other commitment? Is that... That, that could be a potential situation or just, yeah, how to, how to manage only having one slot for an away rotation and balancing that maybe with your home rotation. Yeah. I, I, that, yeah, that I think is a very tough question. My students have been asking me that and I, I don't have a perfect answer. My sense is that the earlier rotations are going to be very uncertain. Um, the later ones, we have a bit more certainty uh, and it's, it's, um, you may have more flexibility with your home program, um, and it will come down to prioritizing and, and I think making your best guess at this point because we don't have that information. Um, I have been advising students to have backup plans for away rotations. Uh, as much as um, if you do need to change your plans and change a, a program or a rotation, I think be very, very uh, cognizant of timing. Um, you don't want to be the person who cancels an away rotation at the last minute, just like you don't want to be the person that cancels an interview at the last minute because you're denying someone else a spot. So, um, 
be thoughtful, be considerate, and, and ultimately things like that will, will really um, reflect on you as an applicant as well. Hey, uh, oh, sorry. Hey, Tabs, let's take a few minutes. Okay. Let, let's take a, let's hypothesize there will be no sub eyes, away sub eyes, or home. Oh, let's just say there's no sub eyes this year. Right. Let's, let's take a few minutes and kind of go around and, f and everybody give a little bit of a, of a thought uh, experiment. Kyle, let's start with you. Um, you couldn't have done, you, you're not able to do sub eyes. You're sitting in Caroline's chair. What would you be doing as a student to try to maximize your uh, matching opportunities? Yeah, um, so obviously I was very lucky in that I really fell in love with my home program. So I didn't need to do a ways necessarily to catch that at the beginning. Um, and somebody did ask a question that I think applies to this, which was um, like, how do I get to know the people in my program? Um, and I think, you know, the point of sub eyes in, in my mind was twofold. And one was to make an impression and sort of meet people and get that extended impression, which you don't have. And the other was to show your work ethic, your ability to be a team player, your ability to finish things and, and do things and be reliable. And so I think the other way you can do that um, is to participate in research. And it doesn't necessarily mean things that, you know, it is hard right now that, you know, the IRB maybe isn't approving things, but I know a lot of people who have said, hey, you know, now that I have all this free time because I'm not doing surgery, I have 10 overdue book chapters. Maybe I should take a look at those. And suddenly you're the student who, if they need editing, do the editing. If you don't know how to do stats, learn how to do statistics, you know, download SPSS, teach yourself how to do it, be the person who can do those things. Um, you know, don't feel like it all has to be, you know, very A to Z, I'm getting the IRB, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, but just sort of introducing yourself as somebody who wants to be on the team and wants to get things done and being very flexible in whatever form that takes and, you know, not feeling like you have to be the first author, you know, prospective clinical trial, just whatever you can get done. I think those, I think that's a great point. If I could jump in just for a second, mm -hmm. um, I um, I think one thing about a pandemic or a crisis is that it really uh, shows who we all are um, to ourselves and to everyone else. And and I think I can see that playing out on many different levels. People who are already doctors, people who want to become doctors and orthopedic surgeons. Um, and I I think this is I, I could see. I could very well see an interview question being, so what did you do during COVID-19? What did you choose to do with your time? Um, and, and there is no right answer to that. You know, everyone, everyone has different strengths. Everyone, like I said before, brings something different to the table. So I would encourage everyone to reflect on, on what is it that makes you the applicant that people want to accept at their program. Um, and and be creative about how to develop that uh, so that when people ask you, you know, what did you do during COVID, um, that you can say something that really shows uh, who you are as a person and as a future orthopedic surgeon. Tabs, you care if I jump in there? I think yeah, go for it. I think that that's a great point because that's going to be a critical interview question down the road. What did you do during this COVID nineteen pandemic? And you can't be like, well, it was a negative situation. I decided to do nothing. The other point I'm going to piggyback off was from Kyle. I know when I was a resident at Drexel, we did not have research infrastructure. And the students that made the biggest impression on me were the ones that really busted their tails on the research end of it. So with this whole pandemic going on, there's nothing that could prevent you from helping and reaching out to uh, residents, fellows, attendings, on getting, uh, getting involved and in helping with research. That can actually, you have some additional time in some ways, you know, that it's, it's a different kind of time that you have now, but that would be an area, if I were in your shoes, that is what I would totally drive home for. Um, I think that that can help you, and I know we'll talk about the letter of recommendation a little bit down the road on this webinar, but what you wanna do is you wanna cultivate a relationship with different attendings so you can get, um, and enhance and augment other elements of your application. So if you can't do sub eyes, where I would first, one of the first areas I would go to would be to try to beef up my letter of recommendation, get involved with an attending who's going to know 
and, and see my growth over my time as a student. So then that can give, if I'm reviewing your application, I can really say, okay, these letters of recommendation that you have, these really tell me who you are. So maybe I didn't see how you were rotating because of the situation. Well, I can get that insight um, from the letters of recommendation. Hey, John Kaplan. Yeah. What do you want? What do you want to tell? What do you want to tell your students right now? Mentor them. So I think the biggest thing is, and this is pre-COVID, but especially afterwards, is a, a lot of of opening the doors. Obviously, you want to strengthen your application. You've heard that a few times, but it's also about advocacy. And I think what echoes with a lot of us is who is your advocate? What are they saying about you? I mean, that's what we're seeing in the letters of recommendation. It's it's who's advocating for you. Um, and you can still use this time to find advocates. Um, for those students that don't have a home program, one thing I was thinking is presumably some way you've been attracted to orthopedics and maybe you've rotated with a community orthopedist. Get in touch with them, find out where they did their residency, where did they do medical school, where did they do fellowship. Inevitably, they're still gonna have connections to some of those programs and get them to advocate for you. Um, ask them to make phone calls and reach out to their colleagues. They all have co-residents and maybe they're not, you know, obviously the community doctor is not in academics, but their co-residents and their co-fellows may be. So you can easily reach out. I, I get that all the time where if, if a student reach out, reaches out to me, I'm an academic program for our fellowships, but not a residency, but I can reach out to TAVs, I can reach out to you. So there's other connections. And so I think it's a matter of identify your advocates, communicate with them, show them why you're interested in, and, and get them to advocate for you. So I, I think uh, if we were gonna summarize um, for you, if this was a hypothesis that we're not having sub eyes, and I think it's a good, it's, it's very important to have that for this class. And what I'm gonna say is the exact opposite of what Seth would ideally like in the utopic world, but that's the reality. So the reality is what's left well, for this class, for you, Caroline, and your cohorts, step one, step two, research and letters of recommendation. And we've taken the sub I out of it. So you should take step two early, especially if you didn't do that well on step one, but you probably should do it early anyway, because it's another metric, hopefully that you can use on, your, on the good side of the ledger. Research, we've been talking about, now there's a problem with research, guys. Research has been shut down, at most medical centers with respect to patient uh, facing research. So that means you're gonna have to get involved with some of the database stuff and a lot of that is being cut out at, at certain journals, but that's okay. You can still try to do some good research uh, as you heard, get involved with residents, get involved with uh, fellows, get involved with faculty members. And if you're at a place that doesn't have orthopedics, you gotta be proactive. Um, I'm sorry that you're at a place that doesn't have ortho, but you really want this. You've got to be more proactive now than you ever thought you were going to have to be to find somebody who can be your mentor. The last part I'll just mention briefly, and then I think we'll talk more about letters of recommendation tabs, um, are that, you know, normally we've always traditionally said, you, as you just heard from John, you need the best advocates possible to write your letters of recommendation. Uh, that doesn't mean your first grade teacher who thinks that you are really the best first grader ever, uh, but you do want people who can be your best advocates. And historically, we've tried to gear, steer you towards orthopedic surgeons because at the end of the day, we all know each other one way or the other. And having somebody who can advocate for you that, that is also in orthopedics has been advantageous. Well, if you take away two sub eyes and two letters of recommendation, and you only have one or maybe two orthopedic surgeons in your home program, you're gonna to have to have advocates outside of orthopedics. And this year, we're again going to completely understand that. So if Caroline has a general surgeon who said, Caroline, you're the best student I've seen at the University of Miami in 20 years. You blow that tabs guy out of the water. <laughs> um, then you want that letter of recommendation. You want that, that person who says, I would love to write you a letter even though you're not going into fill in the blank. So I think that's gonna be my kind of summary of what we can do, assuming that there are not gonna be sub eyes this year. Does that sound, does anybody have, did I miss anything that anyone else would, would add to the mix? So I do actually have a question to go off of that, just looking at letters and the content of them. I know 
um, for orthopedic surgery letters, you like to see the faculty member comment on our clinical performance. But what if we were not able to have the clinical experience due to this? Will you look at that differently in a letter? I think this is a situation, again, where a lot of people are going to be in the same boat. Um, and as Dr. Levine was saying, we're removing one of the variables. Um, just like in a couple of years, we're going to be removing step one, essentially. So that, that it's, it's actually not all that different, except that was planned more in advance. Um, so yes, that is unfortunate and a downside that your letters can't contain that. Um, but I'm not sure there, you know, again, everyone will be dealing with a similar thing and there's probably not much you can do about it. I want to highlight just a couple different points based on questions that have been coming in as well as some of the things that have been said as well. Um, I think just if you're a first, second year kind of just looking ahead, not sure what's going on, or you're a third year rising or even rising fourth year like Caroline is, I think mentorship and being as strategic as you can is critical. And I think that's a very overarching theme you can gauge from each one of us. So identifying people who, just as John said, can advocate for you, but even beyond that, that you can have a good working relationship with to develop not just letters from surgeons per se, but strong personal letters that can speak very well to your strengths and to your character as a person and potential as an orthopedic surgeon are, act, are super important, super tantamount to your success, especially in this sort of tenuous time where you can work on improving your application is from the things that Dr. Levine was talking about. And that makes it hard because if you say, hey, listen, I wanted to accept you early, but I can't right now. I want to do a research year, but there's no research years available right now. Then yes, you have to maximize what you have at your home institution as much as you can. And yes, if you don't have that home institution available, then reaching out to people locally, whether it be community physicians, as John was mentioning to me a few minutes ago, or community surgeons specifically, or if it's ortho or orthopedists at other academic centers that are local to you, this is the time to really branch out and we encourage the mentorship, right? And encourage at least looking for opportunities because you know, they're there, they're all around you. You just have to really, you have to look a little bit, but you can see multiple people here right now getting together in front of, you know, 500 some folks who are all willing to talk shop in this way to try to help y'all. And so I think the more strategic you can be about it, the better it is. When it comes to the notion of, and this is answering another question too, when it comes to the notion of, hey, how do I demonstrate my interest in an outside program? This is where having people who can fight for you uh, so to speak, whether it be via letters, whether it be via phone calls, emails, or whether it be you expressing interest in that particular program, that is going to speak leaps and leaps and bounds and speak volumes about your interest there. It may be secondary to family, it may be secondary to whatever the reason may be, but this is where you're going to have to be proactive in reaching out so you can be as strategic for what you want to accomplish as possible. Hey, Seth, can I, can I ask you a question that's coming up a lot from our folks? You're on mute, by the way. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, talk a little bit about your perspective as a program director on how you value third year grades and how you value extracurriculars. I didn't mention that in my list of things that are, I think are very important. Yeah, no, I think uh, this year, third year grades will probably be more important. Um, I actually occasionally read the psychiatry grades because I think that's uh, helpful in my patient population. They tend to mostly be crazy. Um, anyway, uh, I, I think we're going to have to, we as uh, faculty are going to have to really do a much better job at looking at the application. So uh, yes, Bill, I think every single little um, uh, mark on the uh, application will be important. And the third year grades, I think, will be important. We'll want to look at everything. Um, the dean's letter will probably be also more important. But sometimes I find actually looking at the um, uh, third year performance, it, I guess a lot of that's nested in the dean's letter, but um, I think all of that is, is going to be helpful. I, I, one other um, thing that we had uh, discussed a little bit was about mentorship. And I think probably another important aspect is to, for students to also use residents as their mentors. I think residents can be good advocates for students and uh, is another aspect where you can try to demonstrate that 
who you are and who your personality is. So don't hesitate to also use residents and fellows in that regard. Thanks, Seth. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the questions that's coming up is, is an interesting one. So third year grades can go either way. If you're at a school that has uh, pass, high pass, and honors, then obviously that's going to either be to your advantage or potential disadvantage, how you perform and how you compare. If you're at a school that has pass fail, which is a, a growing number, or if you're at Seth's former school where everybody gets highest honors ever given on the planet for the best person ever, except everyone gets that same grade, um, <laughs> then, then it doesn't matter, right? Then we can't use that as a differentiator. So there's also a question out there about what happens in 2022 when step one goes away. Uh, we won't get into that too much tonight other than to say all these other things we're talking about are going to have increased import uh, for your application. But for this year, the bottom line is if, if you have honors in your third year, if you have research, if you have extracurriculars that you're passionate about, if you have in, uh, really good advocacy, from those that you've had the opportunity to, uh, to learn from and, and be a mentee to, uh, to, uh, towards, those are gonna be the things that you're gonna have to, at your uh, disposal to try to differentiate yourself uh, when we go through this process. I'm seeing a lot of questions out there about who should be writing your letters. Um, and, and I think that, you know, obviously, as, as was discussed earlier, the orthopedic surgeons, great that you've worked with closely is sort of the ideal, but that like everything else, there's going to be a little bit more flexibility and creativity. So I do think it's helpful to have a surgeon perspective. Um, and, and I, I would, I would um, also think it's important to have someone who has worked with you in some capacity, research or clinical um, rather than just someone you know personally. Um, but beyond that, there, there may be the need for to you know, be a, a, stretch the edge a little bit in terms of who those letter writers are. And if you're in a situation where you don't have enough obvious orthopedic surgeon mentors to write you a letter, um, I would discuss that with your program or your advisor, um, whoever uh, is um, at your institution, if you don't have someone, um, then uh, I'm happy to discuss with someone. I have a couple questions to ask some of you. Uh, one of my mentees just asked about whether a resident should write a letter of recommendation, which means he hasn't been listening to my mentorship uh, over the last three years. Uh, no, a resident letter is, no matter how much latitude we're all going to be afforded, a resident letter is probably not going to be much uh, value to you. Um, but somebody's asked a great question, and I'm going to uh, fire this to you, Matthew. Uh, and that is, um, what it, do we think that interviews are going to be pushed back uh, later in the year because of COVID, and perhaps because we'll be doing sub eyes later? Um, I don't anticipate that. Although I, you know, I can't speak for the rest of the people. I wouldn't think that you would alter and shift the timeline. Um, dramatically, because then that would have uh, repercussions later on. I think, uh, from my standpoint, I, I, I wouldn't anticipate that uh, the timeline for interviews would be shifted. Anyone else have a thought on that? Cara, John, Matt, uh, Seth? I think we just don't know. I, I, I think um, in, in writing letters, probably the most important thing is making sure that the person writing the letter really knows you well and is writing you a good letter um, compared to the orthopedic surgeon who may be the most famous orthopedic surgeon in the world writing you a very average letter. Uh, I think all of us who read these letters like to see some personal comments and some um, uh, a connection uh, that the letter writer understands really who the medical student applicant is. I, I know for me personally, and I've, we've had a uh, um, the ortho mentor mindset, we've talked about this, sounds from the training room as has gone into the letter of recommendation. I know I've answered several questions on this panel here. Uh, the, the common one that's coming up is, would you get a non-orthopedic uh, surgeon? And again, I know uh, Dr. Cipriano touched on this too. Um, me personally, what I would say is, you know, and given this situation, I, if I don't get to see you rotate, I would look for a letter that 
demonstrates somebody that can that can speak and attest to your growth over your time as a student. So yeah, it's great if it's an orthopedic surgeon. Um, if it isn't though, that person can still share some insight and give you some substance. So me, if I'm reviewing your application, that still carries some value and that still carries some weight. So I wouldn't throw that out. Yeah, it's great to have an, an ortho attending, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw that out as an alternative option. Somebody's asking what key phrases we use in letters of recommendation um, to tip off whether the, it's a good letter or not. Um, I, I'll just say this, uh, there are some letter writers in this country, uh, as Seth was just mentioning, who say something like this, uh, Kyle is in the top 10% of all students that I have uh, uh, mentored over the last 20 years, except that every single student that that person writes is in the top 10% of that person's experience. So then when you read that letter, you now know that that really doesn't help that person at all. So while they were trying to be helpful to Kyle, they've actually not helped her at all. There's also the recapitulation letter, I like to call it. And that is the um, taking the CV and having their secretary perhaps just kind of translate the CV into the letter of recommendation. You can just take your lighter and burn that one because that's again of zero value. Uh, to you. Now it's hard as the student, like how do I know that? Well, you get a chance when you, even though you won't go, maybe not do sub eyes, but you obviously can speak to the Kyles of the world that just matched and they get a sense when they go around because you know what happens? Seth Dodd says, oh man, that letter that Tabs Air wrote for you is the one of the best letters I've ever seen. Okay, and now Kyle knows, oh, that letter was a differentiator. And so now Kyle can say, hey, Caroline, you're coming behind me. Tabs writes really good letters if you do a good job and you work hard and you do all the things that I did, you can expect that to be a valuable letter. So that, I mean, that's hard. It's obviously one-offs, but I think those kinds of word of mouth experiences are really invaluable for you as you're trying to sort out uh, who should write my letters and, and who shouldn't. Yeah, I totally agree about that uh, as well. Um, I think that, um, asking your uh, the class ahead of you who's graduating right now the current fourth years um, asking them to get a sense of who they thought good letter writers were and then also even asking residents um, who are the better letter writers in the faculty because usually the residents get a sense as well they're all getting letters for fellowship so um, that's a, a good thing to understand in your home program for sure if you can. Kyle, can you talk about your experience with uh, asking people for letters of recommendation and, and your perspective as a fourth year, please? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think this is a particularly strange year in terms of getting letters. It was sort of my, like, as I was going through the process and talking to people who were older than me, um, it became clear that there's certain I think there's a lot of things that you can overthink about. You know, if I get a letter from this person from this institution, are there politics associated? And the advice I got is it's always safe to get people from your home institution because they'll know you the best um, and no one will fault you for that. Um, but for me, I think it was just asking the people that I did, that I did work that I was proud of um, and asking people that I worked with. Um, you know, obviously it won't be the same if you're not doing a rotation with them, but and then just also being a nice person in terms of giving them a lot of time, um, you know, being polite, offering any, you know, method that you can to make it easier for them. Can I send you my CV? Can I, do you want to meet? Do you want to do this? So, you know, just make it as easy as possible. Do it as early as possible um, because it is for your benefit. Um, and so I think just remembering little things like that. I know it's a stressful time, especially now, but um, I think that's a big, that was a big part of it. Or as we're nearing towards the end here, I think one thing I'd like like to kind of go around the go around the quote unquote room and find out is what's the one sort of what's the biggest piece of advice, especially in this era of COVID and everything else, that you would give a student right now. The kind of the most important thing that you would advise any student, whether they're applying ortho this coming year, uh, ortho or any other competitive specialty. Um, or thinking about orthopedics as a career down the line or any other competitive specialty for that matter, what's the number one piece of advice? And I'll start with Kyle, you, just because you went through it just right now. Yeah. 
Um, I think there's a lot that you can't control right now. Um, and that's really hard to accept. And that's, you know, I know you've worked very, very hard up to this point and it can be frustrating to feel like you are missing a lot of the things that you feel like were supposed to happen. Um, and so I would say that because you have a little more time right now, think about what the underlying pieces of the application meant, whether it was to show that you were a part of a team to show, you know, that you're a hard worker, um, and really just boil that down and think about the person that you want to be and how you want to portray that. Um, and I think that's the best you can do and no one will fog you for that. Caroline, what are your thoughts going into this cycle? What's sort of like the most pressing thing that you want to gain from any of the people around you right now, uh, moving forward? Um, gain in terms of like from this webinar itself or from yeah. everyone that I'm surrounded Both. by? Both. Um, let's see, things I want to gain. I think I, mainly want to be able like for me sub eyes were going to be a chance to show programs that i was interested in that program and um see like how i would mesh with their culture their resident population um because camaraderie is very important to me so i think i would like to gain kind of advice in terms of how i can still show programs that i'm interested even though that opportunity is no longer there. Um, and then also things that I want to keep doing is continue looking for research opportunities. Like we've all said, I think it's really important to take advantage of the resources we have, even though a lot isn't there right now, we still do have a lot of opportunities. So that's something that people in my shoes get to focus on. Um, so I think those are the main things. Uh, it is a very uncertain time though for my, my um, seat, but I think we will end up getting through it. Cara? Thanks. So I guess a couple things. Number one, we're all in this together. So together we're going to figure it out one way or another. Um, second, and as I um, mentioned before, you define yourself by how you react to the, the situation you've been, been given. We've all been given this situation. Um, so think about it and figure out what you want to do with it. Uh, it research is a great opportunity, um, as has been discussed, that may be limited, but there are other things you can do too. So if your way to contribute to the world is through education, through community outreach, there are going to be opportunities for that as well. At our, at our program, medical students have done uh, incredible things to um, aid in the COVID efforts. So, Think about who you want to be, um, not just for your application, but for if, if you start from thinking about who you want to be as a person, that will shine through in who you are as an applicant. Matt, what's your one thing you want to share? Yeah, I would say thinking outside the box, get motivated and meet this challenge head on. This sounds a little bit like a Hallmark card or something, but you can use this opportunity to pivot and leverage your qualities as a student or person. And trust me, the person that reviews your application will be able to see through that. And if I'm in your shoes, the low hanging fruit in my mind is research. I've probably written papers with close to 100, 100 plus different students, many of whom I've never met in person, but I have enough projects, I can always find a way to get people involved. And I, the, the students that have really jumped out of my mind have been very motivated. What can I do next? What can I do this and that? And I'll say like, there's nothing going on or whatever, but you know, but, uh, but that's, that's been a big thing uh, for me. So the opportunities are, are there in every situation. John? Um, you know, I'd say that while medicine and orthopedics are a unique field, it, it's no different than succeeding in any career. Uh, it's about networking. Um, use this opportunity to network as we've talked about. Um, orthopedic surgery, we are a family and everybody on this panel, but I guarantee almost every program director, every uh, chairman, everybody, even a lot of community doctors are here to help you through this hard time as well. Use that network to your benefit and reach out to people. You can reach out to any one of us on this panel and we'll help you figure it out. You have to take that first step and reach out and use your networks to your advantage. Dr. Dodds? I'm going to add on to that and uh, say that the um, is focusing on uh, programs where you have a connection. Uh, that connection can be 
through other things, research, but it can also be through family members, uh, location, where you grew up, uh, where you went to college, using connections that can be very helpful when it's difficult to express yourself with an application only and you don't have a sub I. Uh, so consider that concept as well. How, how can you use your past life to also perhaps open a window or a door at a program that you'd be interested in? Dr. Levine, what's the one piece of advice you would give? Tabs, I'm, I'm go letting you go next and then I'm gonna take the last word. Ooh, Trump. Cool. All right. <laughs> uh, to remember, just as everyone has said, everyone's offered a great piece of advice over the last hour. Uh, take all this in stride. Know that we and many people are gonna go through this with you and we're here to help you in whatever way, shape or form we can. You know, we've provided our, some email addresses there. Feel free to reach out to us, to ask questions, whatever it may be. But just know that you're not on Lonely Island. There's an entire world around you, albeit quarantined, but an entire world around you willing to connect, willing to help educate, willing to help mentor, advise, and give you and help you get the resources or provide you access to the resources you need. And so the more strategic you can be, the more proactive you can be, the better it's gonna be in the long run for whether it's through this challenge or any challenge. And just as Matt said, you're gonna come out stronger at the end of it all. We've all got, we all have our hurdles that we have to cross and this is just, this is just one of them. And things don't get easier in life, you know? And, but that's what, makes it, that's what makes the journey that much sweeter at the end of it all. Thanks everybody. Um, you know, I, I'm going to just take a moment to, to just reflect on, on the last month. Uh, we've all been witness to something that um, none of us would ever have thought we'd have to experience in our lifetime. Uh, we've uh, witnessed the unbelievable uh, generosity of human spirit. Uh, I have been um, awestruck by those in my department and others who have volunteered to go into the eye of the storm and volunteer when their health and, and potentially their loved one's health might be at risk because of this uh, deadly virus. And so as I think about all of the things we're talking about, uh, I take a step back and I say to each of you as fourth rising fourth year students, uh, I hope for all of you that you have your health, that your families have not been afflicted by this, your loved ones, have not been afflicted by this, and that you all come out of the COVID crisis uh, with your health intact. And with that being said, I think it's helpful to put in perspective that if we can't do sub eyes, you'll, you'll survive. Uh, you will match in orthopedics. You will achieve your goals and your dreams if you've already been on that pathway to achieving it. But you are gonna have to do things that are gonna be a little bit different than previous uh, classes and students uh, like Kyle and everyone on this webinar tonight. And so it's going to uh, allow you to take advantage of these opportunities. And instead of looking about this from what I can't do because I can't do sub eyes, figure out what you can do because of the post COVID world that we now are living in. And I hope that you all do take advantage of that. You all have local mentors or you're gonna find mentors nationally. Uh, Matt's already got 150 of you from this webinar that has signed up to do research with him. I, it's awesome. So, um, but at the end of it all, um, I think I'd, I'd like to just sign out to Tabs, let him have the final word and say thanks to all of you for participating. Uh, this has been videotaped and as we said, we'll get it to the folks who uh, were not able to sign on. And uh, from the bottom of my heart, I'd just like to thank all of you uh, the panelists for taking time out of your uh, busy uh, life right now, uh, even though we might not be doing what we normally do, it's very busy. Uh, and thanks to all 514 of the folks who were on this uh, webinar. Tabs, take it away. Well, first off, Dr. Levine, that was very kind of you. So we're so honored to have you, Dr. Dawes, Dr. Cipriano, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Radcalo, Kyle, soon to be Dr. McCormick. Um, actually, yeah, McCormick. I thought I was going to get that wrong. And uh, the future Dr. Granger uh, here today. And it's, you know, we hope that all of your families are safe. We hope that all the pa uh, participants' uh, families are safe as well. Um, don't, as 
you know, this orthomentor sort of the orthomentor thing has just gotten bigger and bigger. And we can't do that without you, you know, feel free to reach out to us directly on Instagram at, at orthomentor. Uh, feel free to use the email address that we provided. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out with questions. You know, we're all quarantined together. This is the time to reach out. This is time to, to connect, find out information, stay safe, wash your hands, and social hashtag social distancing. Thank you all.